This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. And by Cosmos. Cosmos is building the Internet of Blockchains, an ecosystem where thousands of blockchains can interoperate, creating the foundation for a new token economy. If you have an idea for a dApp, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter to learn more and to get in touch with the Cosmos team. Hi, and welcome to Epicenter. My name is Brian Farman Crane. And my name is Sunny Agarwal. So we're about to speak uh, with Mark Miller, somebody I've had, uh, I've been wanting to have on for a long time. And we had a conversation about Agoric. So Sunny, I think you were familiar with Mark Miller before as well. So where, where did you learn about Mark and his work? Everyone probably knows by now, I, you know, I work on Cosmos and we're focused on like sending, you know, interoperability between blockchains and sending assets between blockchains. And so back when CryptoKitties first came out, I had a question about Cosmos, which made me like, I was asking myself, okay, I can send my CryptoKitty from my, like, you know, the Ethereum blockchain to another blockchain. But how do I breed my CryptoKitty on the other blockchain? And like, you know, if I want to breed my CryptoKitty, because that's the whole point of the game, right? You want to like breed all these CryptoKitties and stuff. And so I realized, oh, wait, every time I have to go back to Ethereum. And like, then I kind of, you know, I think I forgot who it was, maybe Zaki. He mentioned to me that like, oh, you know, check out this Agoric thing. I think that's the key to this entire thing. And so I, I kind of like started deep diving into it and, and I just got so amazed. I, I read this paper by Mark uh, called uh, Financial Instruments as Capabilities. Uh, and that paper, I'm like, whoa, this is so cool. And it just like, it got me really obsessed with it. And then so, you know, I'm really happy that now, uh, you know, Agoric, uh, they've been actually very, working very closely with Cosmos now. They're helping us on the IBC specification and whatnot. So, uh, you know, it's great that, you know, Mark Miller has been like working on this stuff for like decades, like him and like Nick Sabo and like, you know, these are like uh, Hal Finney, like these are like, you know, in my mind, they were like considered like the greats of like the cypherpunk movement. And so, you know, I'm just, I'm just super excited to get the opportunity to work more closely with him nowadays. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely so many interesting concepts there and it's not an easy, it's not easy to understand, I think, but, uh, you know, people who kind of want to get into the weeds of these different mechanisms and architectures of, uh, decentralized computing and uh, this kind of like digital economies, I think we'll find it very interesting. So before we get into the interview, uh, you're going to be at New York Blockchain Week too, no? Yes, I am. And I think uh, Frederica will be as well. Um, and so I'll be giving, a, I'll be at Token Summit for sure. And I'll be giving a talk there. Uh, you might see me interspersing in and out of consensus every now and then. And then uh, Cosmos is going to be having a, uh, you know, a, a, a meetup uh, where co-hosting a meetup with the Avalanche team in uh, New York on the 14th. So if you're if you're free to come around for that, uh, please come check that out as well. Cool. Awesome. And with that, let's go to our conversation with Mark. So here today with Mark Miller and I actually tried to have Mark on the show around four years ago in 2015. Somewhere I had stumbled on his work. So he had done this work on kind of smart contracts, you know, a very long time ago, much before Bitcoin and blockchain and all that. And uh, I, you know, there, he wasn't working in the blockchain or, or Bitcoin space back then. Uh, but I found his email and, and I emailed him and he was at Google at the time. And he sent me a talk that he did in 1997 about smart contracts and the kind of legal ramification and technology ramification of smart contracts which was just amazingly prescient. You'd watch the talk and it's astonishing how many of the ideas that later became, uh, you know, kind of widely used uh, were there. So unfortunately it didn't happen back then that we had him on, but since then Marcus, you know, transitioned, he's left Google and he's working fully uh, on kind of decentralized uh, networks and digital money and kind of the blockchain space in general. So I'm really excited that, you know, finally the episode is happening and we're having, having you on, Mark. Well, I'm very happy to be here. So to start off, I mean, you've been part of this cypherpunk cryptography world for, for a long time, but like, how did you originally 
became involved in that? So I'm going to go all the way back to 1977. I was working with Ted Nelson on Xanadu. Uh, Xanadu and Augment were the two early um, hypertext projects well before the web. Uh, and Xanadu was the one that had the vision of uh, worldwide hypertext publishing as the new electronic medium for humanity. Uh, and Ted and I were both very influenced by George Orwell, uh, 1984, Ministry of Truth. And we understood that the coming world of electronic publishing could be a force for oppression and tyranny, or could be a great liberating force, giving us all uh, private privacy and freedom from censorship. Um, and we very much wanted to, build, to do the second. We saw it as our mission uh, to lead the world into the coming of electronic publishing as a liberating force, and we didn't know how to do it. In 1977, uh, Martin Gardner was editing a column for Scientific American uh, named Mathematical Games, and one issue of that column uh, explained the discovery of the first public key algorithm, the RSA algorithm. And he did not actually explain the algorithm. He explained the, the, the logic of what you could do with a public key system, uh, both the asymmetric encryption for privacy and the asymmetric uh, signing for integrity. Uh, he painted a very nice uh, picture of the power of this. I called Ted up in the middle of the night, very excited. Ted, we can prevent the ministry of truth. Uh, we wrote away for the paper. The paper did not arrive. And we found out that the reason it did not arrive is because uh, the U.S. national security apparatus, some part of it, uh, decided that the paper should not be publicly released. Um, they, under, I'm going to say classified. I don't know what the legal category is. Um, but they made it very clear that they would consider it to be uh, illegal to distribute the paper. I got really incensed by this. I got, I got passionate and angry in a way that I have really not in my life before or since, feeling quite literally, they are going to classify this over my dead body. Um, I went to MIT, hung around campus, managed to get my hands on a paper copy uh, or rather, gloves. I was very careful to handle it only with gloves. Uh, I took it to various copy shops. There were no home copy machines. I made lots of copies at different shops, uh, put them anonymously into envelopes, um, uh, sending them from a variety of mailboxes, uh, sending them out to home and hobbyist computer organizations and magazines uh, all across the country uh, without any cover letter, just the, the article itself. Fortunately, uh, early in 1978, the U.S. government decided to declassify. They gave the, the green light uh, for distribution of the paper. Uh, communications of the ACM uh, immediately published the paper in the February 78 issue. And I will never have any idea uh, whether the actions I took had any impact. I don't have any particular reason to believe they did, they did have an impact. Uh, but the experience of doing that, of, for example, of handing copies of the paper to my friend, to some select friends, saying, if I disappear, make sure this gets out. Uh, this was a really radicalizing moment for me, of realizing the power of cryptography to change the world, to protect, um, to protect us as individuals. Uh, from large uh, and oppressive institutions, um, that this was worth fighting for. Such an amazing story. And I think it's hard for people today to like conceive this, right? Because today you have to, okay, somebody writes a paper, invents some new science thing, they can publish it, right? So the idea that like the government could would, like try to, okay, this information is too important that, you know, the people shouldn't know about this. That's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, there, there have been several phases of uh, governments, of the U.S. government in particular, um, impeding the progress of 
uh, cryptography and impeding the progress of decentralized markets, smart contracts built on uh, cryptography. Uh, export controls lasted till about 1998. Mm -hmm. uh, the e-language, my distributed uh, cryptographic uh, object capability language, that uh, in which a lot of the uh, language-based smart contracting ideas came together, um, uh, we came out with that language be during the era of export controls. Uh, so we had to actually uh, split the effort uh, where, we, where we were distributing it from the U.S. without the cryptography. And then um, uh, Tyler Close, a, a collaborator living on Anguilla, a Canadian citizen, um, then reverse engineered uh, how to put the crypto back in. And the e-language was actually distributed from Anguilla during those, get, those days. Uh, there was also um, you know, the clipper chip trying to get trap doors into mandatory trap doors into cryptography. Um, and then 1998, export controls were lifted. And then after 2001 with 9-11, uh, there was the Patriot Act and suddenly this big chill in the air where Doug Jackson from Eagle, one of the first attempts at doing a, um, a cryptography, uh, cryptographically based uh, a currency system, in this case backed by physical gold, um, uh, he was arrested. Um, so, uh, and, that, and there was a chilling of the work from that forward. So there was a lot of fighting going on. Um, there was the uh, RSA t-shirts where people would um, uh, have the RSA algorithm written on a t-shirt and go across borders with it. Uh, kind of dare, daring uh, uh, people to arrest them uh, because it's a free speech issue at that point. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft had you covered. You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains. Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS and have that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. One click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at MSFT Blockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure for their support of Epicenter. So you talked a little bit about Xanadu and how the, the thing that you guys saw there was this idea of censorship resistant publishing and this amazing you know, force it would be in creating freedom. Of course, the parallels to a Bitcoin are like you know, astonishing, right? Because people would always speak about, okay, censorship resistant money and, and basically speak about it in very, very similar terms. Did you guys back then uh, as early as, you know, when you started working on Xanadu, already think about, okay, maybe this sh there should also be something like censorship resistant money and what that could look like? Uh, I don't know that my thinking about cryptographic commerce all the way to cryptographic money goes back that far. I think my first exposure to um, really strong crypto for money. When did Chowns Digicash first come out? Yeah, I think that was in the 80s, I think. In the 80s, okay. At the time we wrote the Agoric Open Systems Papers, uh, um, 1988, uh, we assumed secure electronic money and micropayments uh, without really exploring how to achieve that. It was more of assuming that there's some solution to that, then elaborating and exploring all of the kinds of smart contracts, all the kinds of behavioral um, commercial institutions and auctions and, and um, 
uh, various kinds of uh, incentive engineering, we called it, what's now called mechanism design. Uh, we explored all of that uh, as computational embodiments of contractual arrangements and institutional arrangements, assuming that there would be an underlying money system. I did do, a, in um, my, um, my 1987 paper, Logical Secrets, a really terrible first attempt at a distributed secure money. But the idea of doing a money with no central issuer, uh, like blockchain has, uh, I did not see anything like blockchain coming. Uh, I was much more thinking in terms of um, like Hayek's paper on the denationalization of money, where you have many separate currencies competing with each other. Uh, and this is in general a theme I'm gonna come back to, which is in general, my approach was decentralized, not the way in which people in the Bitcoin space and the blockchain space refer to decentralized, which is mutually suspicious parties all coordinating together to arrive at consensus on single decisions. That's one form of, of decentralization. Let's call that coordinated decentralization. I was much more thinking what I'll call loosely coupled decentralization, which is what we see in the internet, what we see in the web, uh, where there's tremendous architectural diversity, there's, there's essentially no decisions that everyone has to jointly make, and Hayek's denationalization of money was basically saying the same thing with money. Let, these, let, let many monies compete with each other, uh, let uh, reputation feedback and competition uh, drive the system towards emergent robustness so any one money might fail, but if it fails, the competition will drive customers to other monies. And we saw that as a model for, for commerce in general. Right. Like Brian and I actually chatted once with uh, uh, James Dale Davidson, who wrote the book, The Sovereign Individual. And a lot of people, you know, try to draw a lot of parallels between his that work and Bitcoin. But, you know, in that work, he's actually talking, you know, talking about de decentralized money in a very similar way that you are. Like, you know, he talked about like cryptographic money, but he actually really had the idea that like, you know, there'll be many, many private issuances of money, like a Swiss bank will issue its own money backed by gold. And, you know, this people will issue their own money. And then, you know, users will kind of choose which money they want to use. Yeah. And in the mid nineties, um, uh, Dean Trouble, uh, who's now one of the founders with me of Agoric, um, and that had been collaborating with me all the way, all the way back in the, the uh, late eighties, um, uh, Dean Tribble and Norm Hardy, creator of the Kikos Object Capability Operating System, um, the two of them came out with a decentralized payments proposal. You can think of it as a decentralized money called the Digital Silk Road, uh, which was basically routing payments through pairwise bilateral relationships, where each bilateral relationship has a credit window. So I won't go into it. Uh, it has many similarities to what Interledger is now doing. Uh, but the main thing is that it really was this hyper decentralized in a loosely coupled manner uh, system of payments. But then the as, as you accumulated imbalances for each bilateral relationship, you'd have to clear the imbalance through something else. And that something else was just still assumed to be of a variety of competing real world monies with no new insight as to how to, to make those cryptographic. So I want to, to uh, give a, a special credit here uh, to Nick Zabo, because during this period of the 90s, um, uh, first of all, uh, his vision of smart contract was of tremendous influence on me, um, uh, but also the kind of thing that we now understand from blockchain Nick Zabo was trying to explain the power of that to me, uh, and I wasn't understanding it, and I did not understand it until I saw blockchain, until I understood how Bitcoin and Ethereum work, and then there was this, aha, that's what Nick was talking about all this time. So while I was thinking about the emergent robustness from competition and reputation feedback in a loosely coupled network where any one point can fail, looking at 
inspired by in the market, the dynamics of the marketplace in terms of what happens between businesses. Nick was very focused on the internal controls by which a large institution can, by having internal controls and public audits and, and well-designed governance systems and separation of duties, uh, you can build an individual institution that can be much more trustworthy than any of the individuals in it. And Nick understood that things like Byzantine fault tolerance, like massive replication with cross-checking that were and, and consensus mechanisms is kind of the extreme form of internal control so that we can now build a logical individual institution that is much more trustworthy than anything humanity has been able to build before. And mm -hmm. the kind of contract, there's some kinds of contracts for which that's needed. And the one for which it's most needed, which was highest leverage, is money. And it's no accident, I think, that we saw it emerge first with cryptocurrency. Or specifically, at least for money issuance. Like you said, there's your, your the, uh, you know, I like to call that the distributed version. The distributed version kind of, uh, you know, took, you know, the interledger protocol is definitely, I think, it very sounds very, very similar to what you're, what you're talking about here. But then, you know, in interledger, right, it doesn't have like a native money and it kind of depends on the, it assumes the existence of some other settlement mechanism. While the, but on the Nixabo's vision, like, you know, it seems that, yes, this is good for coin issuance, but at the end of the day, like, you know, maybe payments don't need to be on this. So I think, you know, what I think is actually really interesting is that like the Lightning Network seems like a combination of these two ideas where it's, you can, you, you use a base uh, redundant system for issuance, and then you try to use a distributed system for payments and you can also use the base system along with issuance as a message board or like this reputation right one of the issues i always had with interledger is yes it assumes the existence of reputation but where does this reputation is there a bulletin board where i can go tell everyone that hey look this guy screwed me over there isn't and so that's one of the things that a redundant blockchain also gives you that's kind of what lightning does where like you know if you want to challenge someone you can challenge them on the base chain. So I, th I think it's kind of cool to see that like, you know, both of the, your vision and Nick Sabo's were kind of both correct in, in, mm -hmm. in, in partially. Yeah, uh, it took me a long time to see that. Uh, I think that's exactly correct. Uh, I want to uh, give a shout out to Jorge Lopez, uh, who had studied both what was going on the blockchain as well as my old papers. And he came to me with the integrated vision. And then I saw that, oh, it's not that Nick's vision and my vision are alternatives or competing with each other. They actually fit together and they're actually about different layers of the system. Uh, and that very much inspired what Agoric is now doing, my, my, my new company. Uh, so the way we see the combined vision is that uh, you still want the overall system to be a loosely coupled network of mutually suspicious machines hosting mutually suspicious computation talking, talking to each other. Um, but now we can view a blockchain as uh, a way to build a computer out of agreement rather than building it out of hardware. The, by building it out of agreement, you now have a logical computer that's much more trustworthy than any fi one physical piece of hardware can be. Um, but now it's still that logical computer is just one node on a much larger network. And that larger network can include other you know, communication, secure communication between chains, secure communication between chains and not chains. So all the kinds of coordination we were doing with cryptographic protocols in a loosely coupled distributed system, uh, we can now do that as well on top of blockchains and include blockchains within that overall fabric. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, it's really nice how, how you explain this. And one of the ways that I, that kind of comes to my mind when the way you speak about it is that 
you know, you, you can think of, you know, often one talks with blockchains about, you know, removing the third party, but in a way, the blockchain is a third party, right? It's just a decentralized third party, right? So in many ways, maybe the, the way the interactions, economic interactions work is not that different from the existing world. It's just that instead of the centralized third party, you have the decentralized third party, whereas your work kind of goes into, you know, more, in a way, it's a more radical direction in that it's it's actually decentralized you don't have the third party so much anymore and then of course if you bring the two together that you have maybe some of these architectural differences in, in terms of the way the interactions works and then when you need a third party you have a decentralized third party so yeah i think it's super fascinating how you have this kind of different ideas and different ways that they're playing out yeah i think that that uh there's there's some small number of um institutions uh like money like augur is another great example a uh, worldwide prediction market where you need worldwide credibility without prior negotiation. But most contracts are local and they don't need to run on a, on a globally credible blockchain. And the transactions that they do, uh, they can do against um, local representations of remotely pegged money, which is um, you know, what several parties including Cosmos are doing, what we're doing, and what Lightning is doing, where the transactions that don't need to themselves be on the blockchain can happen much faster and much more privately, and then the, um, the outcome of the transactions can roll up into net inflows and net outflows and have, those, have them roll up the outcomes, eventually roll up into public blockchains without having to reveal what the contracts were that they rolled up from. So you wrote a set of paper called like Agoric uh, Open Computing, I think, right? And there was uh, three different papers and they they had quite a lot of, uh, you know, widely read and they had some impact, I think. So do you mind walking us through like what was the, what were, what are the core ideas that you were exploring in these papers? Uh, there are three papers. The central paper is the one called uh, Markets and Computation Agoric Open Systems. Uh, and uh, that's the one where, uh, where we really go through all of the layers of our vision and how, how each layer builds on the previous layer and arguing for why our foundational layer was necessary to support the higher layers. Um, so at the um, lower layer, we talk about computational foundations, distributed computational foundations with encapsulation and communication of information, access, and resources. Uh, and that's um, uh, encapsulation communication is very much uh, sort of the centerpiece of object capabilities. Encapsulation is a form of property rights, a form of ownership. Uh, communication is a form of rights transfer. Um, so together they form a core rights theory. Uh, uh, information, access, and resources maps very cleanly to confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, integrity uh, turned out to be the, the core issue that most of our later work through the decades has been on. Um, uh, so object capabilities at the low level, and then smart contracting and, uh, and markets and, uh, and auctions for dynamic price discovery and adaptive price-based behavior, uh, including with regard to um, uh, applying the invisible hand to resource allocation issues. Uh, things like auctioning off the next CPU time slice, uh, having markets in space and network bandwidth. And then on top of that, uh, a vision of how the coming of distributed, decentralized mar electronic markets covering the world would be enmeshed with and part of the human economy and really change the nature of the human economy. So that was the central paper. The incentive engineering paper, um, uh, that's the one where we actually sort of go into the, the, to the detailed design of some core auction mechanisms for doing this allocation and some game theoretic analysis of it. Um, and we call, and the term incentive engineering, we didn't know about the mechanism design literature, but, but 
That's just our term for what has otherwise been called mechanism design. And then the comparative ecology, a computational perspective, um, is another kind of big picture paper. Um, uh, this one, taking a look at various complex adaptive systems that we see in the world, the systems in which coherence emerges from, some, from a process that you'd call some kind of evolutionary ecosystem. So we looked at um, real world human marketplaces. Um, we looked at biological ecosystems. We looked at some AI systems that were making internal use of evolutionary adaptation, Eurisco in particular. And we were trying to compare and contrast them in order to, to learn what is the framework that would best create the selective pressure from which distributed problem solving would emerge. And we very much um, supported the use of market mechanisms uh, as a robust system of selective pressure uh, to encourage this, this emergent uh, uh, growth of problem solving ability. So those were the three papers. What was the context of these papers? And so you, you co-authored these with uh, Eric Drexler. And so, you know, for people who don't know, he's like often called like the father of, na of nanotechnology. And so, you know, that seems like a very far off from some of the stuff that you were working on. And so I guess, how did you meet with Eric Drexler and how did you guys decide to write these two papers, these three papers together? So Eric and I have very aligned visions of the future. And uh, Eric's work, when I, when I first met Eric, he was working um, uh, on uh, light sails, on um, uh, basically solar sails for, for propulsion in space. Um, uh, he was presenting at a, at a space conference. Uh, I was working with Ted on Xanadu. I think this was uh, the late 70s, 79 maybe, the Princeton Space Industrialization Conference. Uh, and I explained to him about hypertext and about Xanadu, and his, his jaw kind of dropped open, and he said, do you know how important that is? And I actually learned to appreciate hypertext through his view of it. He saw value in hypertext that none of the rest of us had and really deepened our view of what was so great about it. So we were talking about all sorts of things, but we were thinking in terms of a much higher tech future a higher tech future that would have, for example, the scale of computation that we would have with nanotech based computers, which is still many orders of magnitude beyond the scale of computation we have today. And it was clear to us that at that scale of computation, the central planning approach to coordination uh, would not work uh, and that you needed something uh, decentralized where the overall goodness of the system emerged through loosely coupled decentralization through a coherent framework of rules. And uh, it was that future orientation and also our fascination. Um, there was another critical breakthrough also, which, which came from, uh, I was explaining to Eric my excitement about object-oriented programming. And when I explained to Eric about um, uh, the power of encapsulation um, uh, in object-oriented programming, uh, he said, oh, that's like Hayek's explanation of the utility of property rights. And that was a big aha moment for me. And it was that aha moment, I think more than anything else, that led to the Agoric work. Um, so there's many virtues of property rights, but the one that Hayek explained is in terms of plan interference. Uh, Hayek says that the central problem of economics is how is it that all of these separate creatures, people, uh, with all their um, various intentions and mostly ignorant of each other, formulate plans um, uh, to where those, these plans are to serve their interests and to unfold in a world that in which the plans of other agents that have, that have been formulated in, um, in mutual ignorance of each other are all unfolding together. How do you keep these plans from interfering with each other? 
And Hayek said, well, one element is that by um, dividing up the resources into separately owned parcels, where each planning agent knows that there are some resources that he has exclusive access to, he can formulate some plans minimizing plan interference with other agents. Well, that's exactly the object-oriented understanding of encapsulation, uh, is a way to uh, enable programs that are formulated separately to be able to operate on their own encapsulated data free from interference by each other, and that enables these separately formulated plans to be composed together to realize cooperative opportunities from the composition while still uh, uh, minimizing the dangers of destructive interference with each other. Uh, so that understanding um, made both of our, both our understanding of Hayek's point and our understanding of object orientation deeper and led to the appreciation of object capabilities as a form of uh, um, encapsulation and coordination that is not just minimizing the dangers of accidental interference, but also minimizing the dangers of purposeful interference. Okay, so this is a very interesting uh, concept. So let me let me try to to dive into this a little bit. So you said that okay, with all of these, you know, very powerful computers, let's say with nano uh, nano computers and stuff, then the central planning approach uh, wouldn't work anymore with computing. But it seems like the way you're speaking about it is, let's say I have, uh, or let's say a company, right? A company has uh, various different employees and you know resources and stuff like that. Now within that company, obviously there is a kind of a central planning approach, right? That's sort of the the nature of companies, right? That you say like, okay, there's markets between all the companies, but then within each company, there is the central planning uh, approach. And then I guess there was the you know work by you know, Ronald Coase and stuff about, you know, what determines the size of these firms and the kind of transaction costs. But it, are you are you basically saying that if you think of uh, the different components of a computer program or computer architecture, all of them should interact with some market mechanisms? And, and if that's the case, like, how does that align with property rights? Like, does it make sense, let's say, for a company to own all of these computing resources and then there's still being some market where all of these competing uh, computing resources like interact in uh, you know sort of making payments and trying to maximize their profits and stuff like that. So uh, that's a big question. It has many parts to it. First part of answering it is that I think that prices and adaptive price behavior is not the important early step. Uh, I think the important early step is a system of rights-based coordination uh, so that things that are formulated separately, mostly in ignorance of each other, can still um, be composed together, that, 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 that people can create reusable libraries where there's, in the computational fabric, a notion of separately owned um, data and resources so that we can compose reusable components and get larger uh, outcomes. And the modern richness of software, I think, has largely been based on kind of an informal, hacky, imperfect, insecure rights-based theory of coordination. This is the, the uh, encapsulation of conventional object-oriented programming. Um, and within a company, uh, you also have um, uh, imperfect systems of that are like prices. Uh, you have, you know, for example, in uh, in the uh, on a single machine, you have various forms of priority. Um, uh, on a Google data center, you've also got uh, various priority and and um, and uh, urgency knobs and resource allocation knobs, and all of these are self-reported. There's you know, some, you can think of it, if you want to think of it as a central planning scheduler, you can do that, or you can think of it as, as, as an analog of an auction mechanism. But it's not a central planner in the sense of it making the decisions about what priority other things should have. Rather, 
all of the other things self-report their priority very much the way players in a market um, uh, express priority by using money and, and, and produce price information. So this is kind of a, a cheap analog of prices. Uh, and the reason why you can get along with um, both with insecure encapsulation and imperfect price mechanisms within a company is because the company um, has various kinds of sanction. Uh, everyone within the company is trying to cooperate with each other. Uh, if someone is seen as too abusive, um, uh, you know, taking advantage, then um, the company has other ways uh, to react. So companies have strong admission controls, whereas as soon as you expose this to the, to the outside market, now you don't have those other forms of feedback. You need genuine protected objects, protected boundaries, and you need, for example, Ethereum with, with, gas, with, with the gas system has to have a genuinely robust system of selling resources, uh, not so much in order to have efficient resource allocation, but in order to have not terrible resource allocation. It's not so much a question of optimizing, it's a question of depessimizing. It's a question of avoiding the really terrible behavior. And companies internally have other ways to avoid the really terrible behavior. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos, the internet of blockchains. Cosmos is live and we couldn't be more excited to see so many projects already building on it. Blockchain technologies are evolving fast and development shouldn't be one size fits all. As a dApp developer, you need the tools that will allow your dApp to scale, grow, and evolve over time. The Cosmos SDK is a user-friendly modular framework which allows you to customize your dApp to best suit your needs. It's powered by Tenement Core, an advanced implementation of the BFT proof of stake protocol. Cosmos takes care of networking and consensus and allows you to focus on building your application in your language of choice. Ethereum smart contracts will be supported soon, and the SDK makes it simple for you to connect to other blockchains in the Cosmos network. If you have an idea for a dApp and would like to learn more about the Cosmos SDK, or if you'd like to connect your existing dApp to Cosmos, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter. For Epicenter listeners, the Cosmos team will reach out to answer your questions and help you get started. We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of Epicenter. So I'm actually really glad you mentioned uh, Google's data centers uh, as an example here, because I read an article actually a few weeks ago uh, talking about how Google's actually using their DeepMind AI to coordinate energy uh, resources within its data centers, and that this experiment of theirs actually reduced their cooling costs by 40%. And so, you know, maybe... Do you think that, like, you know, centrally planned, maybe humans aren't the best way of doing central planning, but, you know, maybe this leads into a larger political question, but do you think AIs are on the, you know, brink of being better central planners than both markets and human central planners? So first of all, I want to say, I don't know the particular system that you're talking about. I know a lot about how Google operates uh, more conventionally um, before they, they started applying uh, deep mind technology to this issue. But I also uh, just want to mention um, sort of a reasoning by analogy here. Uh, back in the 1940s and 1950s, in the socialist planning debate, um, when Hayek and Mises would talk about the, what, what unfortunately came to be known um, as the calculation problem. Uh, what should, should have been known and what came to be known in later years as the knowledge problem. But at the calculation problem, it was, well, you can't centralize the knowledge needed for a central planner to act. That's the knowledge part of it. And then there's no possible way you can build a central planner. You can, you can create a central planning institution that would act. And back then, uh, the advocates of central planning were pointing at, look at these newfangled computers. Surely these computers will grow up into central planning agents and they can solve the calculation problem and now we can do central planning. And the thing that the asymmetry 
uh, there was a false asymmetry that was assumed there, which is they were imagining the market of the day with the complexity of the market that they knew and imagining that the planners were much more capable than planners could than the planners of the day because they were using computers, but they didn't imagine that the markets would also have players that were using computers and therefore were all much more complex and interesting. And in fact, the knowledge problem gets worse, not better, as the individual players get more sophisticated and embody more knowledge that they're also not able to articulate. You get almost um, so, into a Turing problem there where, you know, the central planner computer can't simulate all of the millions of computers in today's economy. Right. So with regard to the deep mind thing, once again, I don't know that specifically, but what, I'm, what, what I'll react to is uh, the thing that it's planning is, um, to, uh, is about temperature and power and such things. And that's also not a set of resource allocation decisions that programmers have been writing their programs to deal with. It just hasn't been on the radar. Uh, traditionally, so that so that there is no local decision making by programs uh, to try to be adaptive on those on those regards. So it's essentially a situation where we had no decentralized planning and very poor centralized planning. So it's a situation where we're planning so badly that even a central planner can do better. Once you've got that kind of sophistication. Uh, in the, the agents that are subject to the plans, and they are now also as capable of reasoning about those issues, then you have to again ask, uh, does the asymmetry go away, where the, where the central planner has gotten special technology ahead of all of the agents that are subject to its control? That's a really uh, nicely how you explained this. And I must say, I find it like kind of encouraging knowing that it seems to, it, it, if, if this is true and gonna hold true, then maybe it is something that will kind of work counter towards some of the centralizing aspects that come with AI. And, and so then one last question I have about the papers uh, before we, you know, I wanna go back into talking about the Agora company, but you know, what about like the fact that like, you know, when Hayek, he talks about, you know, part of the issue, I think, is that humans are very complex beings, that it's, you know, part of the measurement problem or information problem, as you phrase it, was how do you measure people's utility functions, right? These, like, you know, no one, we don't have a way of doing that. But when we're talking about bots here, right, like, you know, just computers, like, it's pretty, I, I feel like, at least until we have very strong AIs, like, the, they, they don't seem very complex creatures. And so we can, I think it might be possible to model these simplistic bots rather than humans. And so I don't know if some of Hayek's ideas around this like complexity of humans comes into play or not. The notion of utility function uh, is a, uh, I think is, is very much like the notion of the perfectly spherical cow. Uh, it's um, there is this complex real world, both for people and of programs, where what you've got is behavior that has been shaped over time to be adaptive and serve some interests. And then you have uh, outside the system uh, using the concept of a utility function as one way of idealizing the behavior to reason about it. Um, but there is no representation in the person's head or in the program of a utility function. Programs have complex behavior that are written by programmers and modified by programmers over time to adapt to whatever the complex job is that the program is doing, um, uh, both with respect to what the job is and with respect to um, how the program is performing the job. Uh, and the programmers uh, modify and change it um, uh, in complex ways uh, to just be more adaptive. Uh, and 
It's very hard to reason about programs. What we know is that it's impossible in general to predict what a program will do other than by running it. So then our computer systems run the programs, discover what they do by running them, but I wouldn't call that um, uh, central planning. I would call that just a distributed system of the running programs. Cool. And so kind of to go back into, uh, lead back into the blockchain stuff, uh, one of the things that, you know, kind of interested me about this uh, property rights, you know, I think in the blockchain space, we have two very uh, prominent models of uh, property rights and fees, transaction fees that are kind of dominating right now and are very different. You have the first one, which is, you know, kind of done by Bitcoin and Ethereum, where, you know, there's a limited amount of block space or gas limit, and people use fees to basically, it, it's essentially going in a constant auction where there's a limited amount of block space. And if you want to get in, you have to put in a fee and it's, you know, the highest number of people get their uh, fee, fees. And, you know, there's a lot of innovation going around in that front. Like, you know, Vitalik has a proposal for like, you know, doing different type of auction mechanisms and whatnot. But then there's a complete other end, which, you know, I think this is one of the few interesting things that EOS actually did, was they proposed a more property rights based model of fees. So the more EOS tokens you have, you get, you know, let's say you, it's a little bit more complex, but for simplicity's sake, you could say that if you own 5% of the EOS tokens, you have the rights to use 5% of the EOS blockchain's resources. You have 5% of the disk space, 5% of the computation power. And so that takes almost a more property rights approach rather than this constant auction. So, can, you know, what are your thoughts on these two approaches? And So yeah. I don't know the EOS approach. I also don't know uh, Vitalik's uh, recent proposals. Right now, we don't have good composable systems of electronic rights. And I think that that's really sort of the prior issue. Uh, so in that sense, I'm responding positively to what you said about EOS, although even though I don't know the actual EOS system, having a foundation in rights and rights transfer is, uh, I think, the right conceptual starting point such that markets emerge from, uh, from interaction between multiple parties uh, within a, a rules-based, rights-based framework. And uh, obviously, uh, auctions uh, uh, is one way to do that. Um, a proportional share ownership rights is another way to do that. Uh, all of these things are worth exploring. I don't have a, a strong opinion that one is better than the other. I will say that, uh, that Agoric uh, is planning to implement uh, the escalator algorithm uh, for scheduling uh, on the Agoric blockchain. Um, but uh, we also uh, want to encourage all sorts of different experiments there. Okay, this is this is perfect because that's kind of leading us exactly where, where I wanted to go. So, I mean, there were the papers many years ago which had the name Agoric in it, but then much more recently also, uh, you know, you co-founded a new company uh, that, you know, is also called Agoric. So can you tell us a little bit like what what is the the main vision of the company? What are you guys trying to accomplish? So what we're trying to accomplish is to bring the world economy online. And right now, there's a problem, which is uh, the blockchain space, the world of smart contracting that we're seeing has not been successful at penetrating the mainstream economy. Uh, that it's basically this separate world and the business activities in the mainstream economy uh, see a barrier there that they're not getting over. So uh, markets are all about network effect. We want to create a uh, distributed system of objects in contracts on different platforms, blockchains, not block, non-blockchains, permission quorum systems, individual machines, uh, both publicly and within companies. We want to, to, to span that entire network of activity 
in a uniform framework of, at the low level, object capabilities, and then at the high level, the system of electronic rights and smart contracts that we want to build on top of that. Uh, and the result is that we want to enable the mainstream economy to be able to take incremental steps towards adoption of the technology where all of the steps towards per, uh, uh, complete public participation uh, are as smooth as possible. I want to make an uh, analogy here, uh, which is on the web. Uh, the web, as we think of it, is mostly a public thing, but the fact that companies inside their firewalls have their own internal private websites and the content on those websites freely link into public pages and people inside the company following the links go from internal pages, navigate to external pages in this completely seamless manner. That's good for the public web and it's good for the spread of the technology to apply to, to things for which uh, public visibility is not appropriate. And so do you see a similar, a similar function that Agoric will have in that, okay, people can kind of seamlessly go from like traditional, uh, traditional means of doing commerce to blockchain base and it like this kind of friction goes away? Yes, there, there are several barriers. One of the, the biggest ones is that um, smart contracting right now is too hard and too dangerous. We've seen smart contracts constructed by experts uh, in which hundreds of millions of dollars have disappeared overnight with no recourse due to simple bugs. Um, and in order to open this world to the mainstream, you have to make it much more reasonable for programmers who are not experts on smart contract and programmers whose experts lie in their subject matter to be able to create um, business arrangements, contracts, um, institutions uh, with much greater confidence that their contracts mean what they think they mean. And our approach with object capabilities and e-rights, which I'll get back to in a moment, uh, uh, helps tremendously in creating system of, of compositional, reusable contract components that enable that kind of construction with confidence. We did a lot of this exploration I mentioned in my e-language. Um, uh, for the last, um, for 10 years, um, well, starting in 2007, I've been on the JavaScript Standards Committee, getting the enablers of that into the JavaScript standard so JavaScript now supports a, a subset, which is an object capability subset of JavaScript that essentially includes most of JavaScript, such that many old JavaScript programs run in SES, we call it, Secure ECMAScript, which um, comes out of work we did at Google, and now is work that, that Agoric has, has done in collaboration with Salesforce. So the result is that we're bringing this to programmers, not just as an extension of the object-oriented paradigm that people already know so that they can extend the intuitions they already have about objects, but we're even bringing it to them in a language that, that 20 million programmers are already familiar with. How does this relate to the language you guys have been creating with this uh, Jesse uh, idea? Is that is that related? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So there's two subsets of JavaScript that we've defined. A very, a, a very large subset we call SES and a very small subset we call Jesse. So Je and Jesse, where Jesse itself is a subset of SES. In doing secure programming, there's sort of two fundamental uh, stances you can take with regard to code. There's, I want to protect myself from misbehavior by your code. And I want to ensure that my code means what it thinks it means. And in particular, when I express security policy in my code, how my code should, let's say, enforce certain terms, certain arrangements on your code, that I want to know that my code is interacting with your code in the way that I think my, that I think my code was designed to. 
So SES is designed to solve the first problem, which is that I can run your code that I don't trust inside an SES, if you want to call it a sandbox, under object capability rules, where I can confident that your code has only gotten the authority that I intended to give it, that, that, that uh, your code cannot escape the sandbox, cannot do things with more authority uh, than it was given. Um, and because Jesse is a subset of SES, your code might be in Jesse. But if I'm just protecting myself from your code, I don't care whether you stayed within Jesse or whether you're using full, full SES. For my code, um, JavaScript has many hazards. You know, double equal, for example, is sort of the famous one that has crazy coercion rules. So, so everybody's programming style for JavaScript says avoid double equals. So in Jesse, we just define a subset that omits all of the, the unnecessarily dangerous things, only includes the best parts. And the wonderful thing is that the best parts of JavaScript um, are a really good programming language. Uh, so we've been essentially keeping our code in Jesse. Uh, we expect to be uh, also, we've been doing, uh, we've been collaborating with uh, academics on formal specification languages uh, so that you can verify that object capability code means what you think it means. We think Jesse is the candidate to apply those tools to. That's how those things fit together. Okay, great. So yeah, that's very interesting, right? So the, all your work on smart uh, on JavaScript and secure JavaScript and how that's kind of coming together. So yeah, you spoke a bit about uh, JavaScript and how you guys enable smart contracts there, but like, what is powerful about this approach and what are kind of the capabilities that the approach that you guys take to smart contracting has? So one of the things that makes our current world of software so rich and so composable is higher order composition. And what I mean by that is um, uh, we start with higher order functions where a functions can operate on data and compute things can operate on values, but the functions themselves are values. So higher order functional programming is where functions operate on functions with, with, with no limitation. Uh, objects, um, cause effects, cause, take actions, and objects can also hold and manipulate other objects. So a table uh, can take, can store any kind of object, but then when you reify a concept like a table into an object, then you enable the kinds of things that objects manipulate to be also the kind of thing that the, that the reified manipulation is. Uh, likewise, in the marketplace, much of the richness of the market interactions we have is the reification of uh, the, re the reification nature of property rights. That property rights started off very literal, but then any time you create a contract that unfolds over time, the continued participation in the contract is itself valuable, and by labeling that continued participation a property right, then any contract building block that's generically parameterizable over anything that's described as a property right can now operate on the rights created by, by other contracts and you can compose contracts together. As an example, like, you know, so I can imagine an options contract where, you know, an options contract is basically me making a contract with you saying, hey, you know, I want the ability to buy this from you at a later date. But then I can turn this contract into an asset itself and I can go resell my end of the options contract. And so you turn contracts into assets and you can make contracts out of those assets and, you know, you can have this iterative approach where contracts and assets are kind of interchangeable. That's right. So we talk about the duality of contracts and e-rights. Contracts manipulate e-rights and contracts that unfold over time create e-rights. And ERTP, the Electronic Rights Transfer Protocol, is the top protocol layer in our system. Um, and it's, all, it's essentially a set of object interfaces um, and specifications 
uh, for generically representing a wide range of kinds of rights, rights that are fungible and non-fungible, um, divisible, so, so money, non-fungible things, uh, and the right to continue participating in contracts within our framework are all reified as rights described by ERTP. And then to the extent possible, we create contract components that assume of the rights that are manipulating, that only assume that they're described by ERTP. You can't always do that, but we can do that with exchange. You can do that with uh, options and futures. You can do that with, with a variety of auctions, uh, single auctions, continuous double auctions. So we have this tremendous opportunity to create highly reusable, generically parameterizable contract components that can, in which you can feed any ERTP described contract. And then if that contract unfolds over time, then it creates a new derivative right that in turn can be fed into other contracts. Right. And so, you know, for our listeners who want to like get, you know, a much better understanding of this, I, I highly recommend one of Mark's uh, papers he wrote called uh, Financial Instruments as Capabilities. And to me, like, you know, when I was first trying to understand this whole capability stuff, it like didn't make sense. But then like after reading that paper, I'm like, oh, like, you know, it had a little bit of pseudocode in there. And it's like, OK, reading that, I'm like, OK, now I see how this makes sense. And I, I can visualize how to put these pieces together. The paper is, uh, the, the actual title is uh, Capability-Based Financial Instruments. It was published in uh, Financial Cryptography 2000, uh, which, by the way, also occurred on Anguilla. Uh, Anguilla became a little haven of crypto activity because, uh, initially because of the export controls. Yeah, so we'll definitely link to that in the show notes. Um, and so then the what, another question i wanted to ask was you know now that you have this ertp uh system and this jesse smart contracting language you know you could have went ahead and created a simple smart contracting platform like ethereum or tezos or you know any of these systems but it seems you guys are not just creating a single blockchain contracting platform so could you talk uh, a bit briefly about what the goal there is with that so so again it's it's um it's network effect uh, and it goes back to the differing early visions of hypertext. I hadn't thought to make this analogy before, but Doug Engelbart's augment system was kind of a single system for those who signed up to augment, whereas Xanadu was a worldwide distributed, loosely coupled hypertext publishing uh, system where there's no one provider. We want to enable um, uh, contracts that span from the from the one extreme of completely permissionless, globally credible blockchains, uh, all the way to um, uh, various systems that are more private. Uh, but one of the things that I think is really important is most contracts are local. Most need for contracts are local. Most actual real world contracting is local. There's no need for to create worldwide transparency into the internals of a contract that's done by a small set of parties. And then there's a few arrangements, which I, I would call more institutions than contracts, uh, that do need that credibility. And we want to span that whole range. There's this large trade-off space. We want one uniform mechanism that can sit on top of that diversity and span it uh, and enable contracts that started off being designed for one place in that fabric to be able to be moved and continue execution in another place on that fabric. Cool. Well, uh, thanks so much, Mark. So I think that there's so much there uh, to talk about and to dive into. And, and there's a lot of resources we talked about that we, you know, we'll put in the episode link. So if people want to dive in, there's definitely plenty to keep somebody busy for weeks or months. And yeah, we're, we're very much looking forward to also seeing kind of what comes out in terms of practical use cases out, out of your work work on Agoric and you know, hopefully we, we can do another episode at some point in the future. So thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, it was a real pleasure. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.